Well, that's new. <laughs> that was cool. I did like that. You like that? Yeah. And you're forever saying you're busy. How have you found time to do that? Do you want me to play it again? <laughs> no, you can play it at the end, maybe. I'll play it on the way out. Okay. Play it on the so way out. So today, we are talking about... Go on then, tell them what we're talking about. <laughs> oh, I couldn't tell if you'd froze <laughs> or if you'd... <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Anyway, yes, we're talking about the great Blavatsky, or Madame blah, 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 blah. Helena Platrova Blavatsky. Yes. We already have a question. Okay. Which is not Care about Blavatsky, but kind of is. Mercury retrograde gentleman, just kidding, sorry, lol. I can put that on the big screen. Look. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I do not really care much for Mercury Retrograde. You might think we're having technical difficulties, but it's not technical difficulties we're having. It's that <laughs> certain things are supposed to happen that people do, and the people didn't do the things they're supposed to do, <laughs> ultimately. <laughs> Okay, Blavatsky. You can't blame Mercury for that. No, Blavatsky. Let's blame but her. We do all have good days and we do all have bad days. But, so. but we do have a new theme tune. So, you know, swings and roundabouts. We may be 35 minutes late, but... <laughs> We have made a new theme tune for you guys, so, you know, <laughs> swings and roundabouts. Is that your way of saying count yourself lucky? <laughs> yeah, count yourself bloody lucky, you people. <laughs> Helena <laughs> Petrova Blavatsky, a Russian occultist, one of the most famous occultists in what Chris would call modern history. Yeah. She's a, modern history. She's younger than a thousand years old, so she's modern. She's modern. Most people think modern is in 20th century onwards. <laughs> but she was no. reigning 1800s, I think. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. Should we tell you a little bit about her? I think we should tell you a little bit about her. I think so, because I would hope most of them have heard of her because she was at least involved in the um the whatchamacallit the spiritualist movement and most people have heard everybody that was ever a spiritualist mm, yeah and the theosophical society as well yeah so i'm gonna do my liam intro to famous occultist helena blavatsky is a Liam okay. intro because it won't necessarily be a work of art, but I'll give it a go <laughs> anyway. Okay, so if you don't know what she looks like, Helena Petrova Blavatsky, Russian aristocrat. She had a little bit of money, she used that to travel the world and to learn her stuff about occultism and magic. She went to the east. And she decided, I'm going to steal all of these secrets about karma and reincarnation and the like. And I'm going to take them back to the Western world. And I'm going to write a load of books about it. Massive books that no one ever reads because they're too big. She founded the Theosophical Society with a bunch of other people. And she was big with spiritualism. But there are some spiritualists now. There she is when she was a younger. And there she is when she was older. Ultimately, she liked to do medium shit and was interested in all that kind of jazz. She was so sane, managed to contact Ascended Masters. Because she believed... There we go, there's the three Ascended Masters that she allegedly contacted. So, I think what we need to talk about is we need to talk about Ascended Masters, Chris. We need to talk about what happens when you die. 
we need to talk about what people think uh, or what she thought was good or bad about um, mediumship and contacting spirits because she had some quite, um, well, put it this way, her views are legendary and they go very much against what a lot of spiritualists kind of thought. So let's go back here to the big screen. And Chris, where should we start? Should we start with her massive collection of works? Because she was a pen in a lot of big books. This, yeah. Isis Unveiled, was one of her first books, right? It's a big and book. And there's two Look, of them. It's bigger than my head. That's the first volume, right? <laughs> the first volume. The second volume. That's a big yeah. lot of work. Most of the occultists, they got these on their shelves, but they don't actually, they certainly got the PDF copies, but they certainly don't read the whole thing. I'm yet to find anyone that's actually read Isis Unveiled from cover to cover. But it was her first kind of major work. She was definitely a writer. The more famous one, The Secret Doctrine, she wrote a lot later in life in fact i think she may have passed away not too long after she actually released this one but again if you're thinking okay a bit of light reading i won't bother with isis unveiled i'll go for the later one because obviously because she wrote isis unveiled when she was a little younger all of that extra knowledge she would have learned from a traveling and a talking to people and uh, messing about with the theosophical society i know that'll all be in the second work so I'll buy that because it will be condensed. No, no, no. Second work, volume one. <laughs> volume two. This is the reason why people do not read Blavatsky. She done not <laughs> waffle on, Chris. She waffles on more than me. <laughs> if you want to read her collected works, the famous ones, that's what you've got to contend with, right? Yeah, so basically, we'll tell you what you need to know. What you need to know is that Blavatsky, she had enough money to travel the world. She thought that, like what a lot of people do, she studied Western occultism, Western magic. And then she thought, I think there's something missing here. They people over there, they do things a little bit differently. Let's see if we can go in and steal their secrets and the like. So she traveled to the East. And she had tried to learn the secrets of the magic from all the gurus and that. And then she came back again and wrote about it and brought a lot of those ideas over here. When I say those ideas, bastardized versions of those ideas. is people like Blavatsky that are good and bad. They're good because they're occultists and they're trying to yeah. further their knowledge. And they come out with lots of really interesting ideas based on the work that they do. But they're bad because if they misunderstand something, they're publishing their work and pushing it out to the forefront of kind of occultism. And then people kind of latch on to bits of that. So the kind of idea of karma and re reincarnation and how it works, yeah. a lot of that kind of thing, you start to see that with Blavatsky. And people latch on to bits. The reason is, is because they won't read the whole thing. They'll latch on to a tiny little bit that they can put copy and paste and make a what nowadays we would say social media or a Pinterest or something like that out of a little quote. But the interesting things in regards to Blavatsky is that she was a spiritualist and she did do seances in communication with the dead and that, but she said and thought that actually there is reincarnation, but what mediums talk to when they conjure up a dead person, generally isn't a dead person. It's either a shell of part of a dead person. It's not really their, their soul, essentially. It's kind of some sort of shell. I would liken it to, you know, when you cook a nice stir fry and you eat the stir fry, but there's all the crap that's left in the bottom of the, the wok, you know? It's kind of, you could say, part of the meal. It's not really part of the meal. The good stuff's gone. That's just the husk, the kind of crusty <laughs> bit at the bottom that's kind of still left there. 
that's what she <laughs> kind of thought in regards to uh, the spirits of the dead and that. They're either shell, shells, shells, sorry. Not supposed to say the shell word, or the conspiracy theorists won't like it. We'll get called shells again, Chris. Shells for the <laughs> Illuminati. Um, or she said that they were elemental spirits, so different types of spirits, messing about, causing trouble and pretending to be ghosts and that. Which I can kind of understand, because I've messed about with the paranormal investigators, making them think they're seeing a spirit, when actually it's just like some I made up to trick them. And that does happen quite a lot, so you can kind of understand that. Um, she was accused, although she was a medium, of faking mediumship. And she actually admitted to, yes, I faked a couple of things when I couldn't get things to manifest. Um, but her real passion, I think, was blending science and religion and magic and all that together. And her viewpoint, I think, when she or she may have arrived to it a little later in life, but her viewpoint was kind of that which you shouldn't really bother with trying to conjure the dead. You should let them go off and do their thing. So it's really yeah. difficult to tell because she did admit and talked about, oh yeah, I faked mediumship stuff and that and phenomena and stuff. But at the same time, you've got this very serious occultist that's written a hell of a lot of books about the subject we're not talking about trying to make money from books we're talking about the sort of things that very serious people buy and stick on a shelf you know it's not like the money going to the papers and that um and you kind of have to ask yourself well given her belief did she think that it's probably better not to contact and conjure up a spirit and to just pretend you're doing it as opposed to annoying the spirits, maybe? I don't know. It's difficult. She ain't around no more to ask. Um, but we could maybe conjure up or something like that. But technically, mm -hmm. Chris, would that be ethical? Because she thought her beliefs were a reincarnation. I should be going on. I shouldn't be sticking around. So is it unethical to forcibly conjure someone up that don't want to come? Well, to some people, yeah. <laughs> I think it it's more a case of oh I can hear myself so I turn the sound down it might be my end it's probably your end is that better? that's better that's better the um yeah so ethically yes I suppose that would be the question is whether or not what part of her spirit you're conjuring because she could be quite easily in in another lifetime by now um and therefore you know do you just summon part of her consciousness um from the time period where she actually where we actually know her from or if we're calling her back from the future so it depends on what how you how you in feel about it the correct procedure for a conjuration of someone from the distant past what you need to go is you need to go through and you need to access their astral body. So you need to go through to the astral world because the astral world times a little different there. So you can literally go through, go into the close by astral that is still close by, therefore mirrors this world that we're currently in and the time zones and that. Reach through a bit further, go back on yourself to go back to the earth, but at a different time. And then what you want to do is you want to get when the spirit of the person, because they've got an astral body, of course, everyone does. On the death point, obviously, it will kind of retract. So it will go, person dies, astral body then starts to dissolve. So you want to pluck it before the dissolving yes. starts happening. So it's kind of momentarily after death. You want to go back in time, grab that, and pull it back. Pull it, obviously, because it's got to be comfortable. So do a proper evocation, create the right um, environment for that thing to manifest and survive, and then pull that through for your evocation. If you're trying to do the connecting and you're not taking into account the crossing bit and you're expecting them to still be around now, like a stereotypical ghost that haunts something, probably not going to happen. Unfortunately, you're going to have to reach back in time and get them at that point between when they are a dying and when they cross over and dissolve completely. Yeah. That's the sweet spot there. That's the mm -hmm. secret to necromancy, is a creating an environment 
whereby and a doorway for you to reach through, grab the person at that point, pull them through, and make sure that they are wrapped up in the nice environment, your sacred space, that the neopakers like to call it, and um, then it won't dissolve away, okay? And then you can put it back afterwards. Much like when you go for a picnic in the park, you clear up your litter, don't you, Chris? Of course. Yes. You make it sound so easy. <laughs> I'm just giving the basics because that's where people go wrong because people don't understand evocation. We have got an evocation they course coming They don't consider soon. it, do they? But, yeah, so uh, the spirits and the like that she connects with, she's uh, found... Okay, some of them might be not. Some of them might not be what they say they are, and others might be kind of the spirit, but there's a big components missing. Kind of like my nan when she had dementia, she was kind of there, but she wasn't really there. You know, that's yeah. what a lot of the working with dead people that are currently in the dissolving process is kind of like. To be honest with you, yeah, um, is a little bit different, but. Is worth the experimentation because I don't want to ruin it all because that's not that's bad in it when we ruin the secrets and that. Yeah, don't let's not ruin it. It's there's plenty of room to explore there. That was another comment. So <laughs> her ideas of um, ascended masters, then Chris, because that's a fascinating, isn't it? Ascended masters. Yeah. And you get you get some of those ascended masters uh, tarot decks now too. Just oh, I've never with. seen one of them. Send Master Tarot. You've not seen those? Yeah. No. they got people What's like Jesus in them, them, obviously. All oh, the people have replaced. Okay. So they've been, re they've re do they replace the tarot cards with just figures, kind of like an oracle deck, or do they still have yeah, like, like the an hanged oracle man deck. and that? So the hanged man's actually Jesus on a cross or something. Probably. They work like um, that, I don't know. But yeah, they're, they're, they're more of an them. oracle I think they're more like oracle cards than they are right, tarot. Right, okay. I can understand that. So I've never got. I suppose oracle designed in now. order to try and access. So, but you know, it's whether or not they understand the meaning of the word ascended masters. I guess the words like ascended masters, because mm -hmm. obviously traditionally they are all these groups of people, um, like that are supposed to have reached enlightenment. So you know, the Buddha, um, a lot of these saints, um, and obviously some of the kind of lesser, well, what we would call lesser deities, um, those sorts of people. Yeah. So if you're talking evolution, you're talking evolution of the soul, you're talking people that have gone past the abyss i suppose is what they call in occult circles yeah. so they've been able to achieve what some would say a higher level of enlightenment it's not really enlightenment it's more of a case of they've evolved to the point where they're actually becoming a household name and almost like a mini god or goddess type of thing so they're getting to the point of having enough power not to have to like the lab lamp come back and reincarnate in a physical body because they might not want to do that they could do that if they want they're probably not going to reincarnate entirely with a physical body because that's not really how it works. Normally, you just send a piece of yourself. Yeah. But there we go. That's a whole complicated thing, and I'm not entirely sure Blavatsky talked much about that. I don't know if that was the sort of magic that she dealt with. I know she dealt with the Ascended Masters. So her perspective, I suppose, was, okay, there's humans that have ascended to become super i don't know the next run up from your average human so they've gone up to become like uh human god type things you know yeah but it's what they and, uh, it, is she closer to using the phrase uh the greater dead which would that so be closer? The mighty dead i think is what a lot of me mighty dead. Papers would call it they'd say mighty dead so people that have mastered that kind of reincarnation process they've ascended to the next thing i suppose it's kind of like in the shop you have your sales assistant and then you have your supervisor and then you have like yeah. other things assistant manager branch manager area manager that they've kind of got to supervisor now i suppose um 
but yeah, essentially you're talking about, okay, so these people, they're staying around kind of in a, not in a physical form, but they're sticking around anyway to help other people on their magical way. I suppose not, it's not entirely different to us, except we're physical people, aren't we? Well, at the moment we're yeah. virtual, but we are actual physical yeah. people. We do exist. We're not like Kit in that Knight Rider car. Yeah. So, yeah, where are we going to go with this then? Well, it's it's a tricky one to kind of explain. So from... As in, because obviously... Sorry, I've got hiccups. Um, yeah, Ascended Masters, the closest we all probably get to is talking about... Um, talking about the mighty dead in this kind of like, steps of evolution the question would be whether or not um Blavatsky would actually have considered it in that same way um with the spiritualism it would be a case of normally you know there we've got that kind of the mighty dead concept that kind of fits in there too um where you're considering you know not quite it's it's reincarnation from a neoplatonist point of view is kind of what um you're kind of trying to unwrap there um in order to try and make sense of it um whereas actually the concept is like a lot of the things that blavatsky brought back is kind of this blend of um west meets east and are therefore you know is where we get our western ideas of karma from that i don't even remotely resemble um what the eastern uh, the eastern concept of of karma would be um she was another big one for uh, kind of trying to uh, make the kabbalah um accessible to the west to a western opinion again gets watered down i imagine it's a, a great part of where um you know, the starting points of Wicca occurred is from playing with these kind of ideas that Bravatsky's brought, bringing over um, from from the West, uh, from the East to the West, um, and then kind of repackage this kind of, which eventually obviously leads to this idea of rule of three or uh, and the Wiccan read, etc. is where this kind of Western version um, of kind of, uh, you know, um do harm and it comes back kind of situation you know be good um and you will um ascend so she was one of the founders of the theosophical society which exists to this day it was around 18 1870s i think the theosophical society came about something, something for like um and the Theosophical Society, I suppose its purpose is to blend Eastern mysticism, magic, culture with Western, come together to explore more. So a kind of the concept is there's a lot of magical practice and mysteries. People that practice magic in the West know a couple of pieces to the puzzle people in the east know a couple of pieces to the puzzle if you learn both systems and explore both systems you're going to have more pieces to fit to understand the wider puzzle that is the universe and the like one of the interesting things that she um believed or was a supposedly the purpose of the theosophical society was to prepare the world for the arrival of what quote unquote they often call the world teacher, which is essentially yeah. kind of like a Jesus type person, is someone that's supposed to manifest and bring the world into a new step of enlightenment and um, knowledge and all that kind of thing. So, one person that ends up turning up and helping humanity in general as a species on this planet evolve, reach the next stage, so the kind of age of Aquarius. Yeah, they say, okay, in this kind of age that we're coming into, we're coming into a great enlightenment, and that will start when this world teacher comes about. 
and the Theosophical Society, I suppose they're trying to work out who the person is. Mainly they're trying to prepare people and get them used to kind of forcing, I suppose, a certain amount of spiritual enlightenment through teaching magical practices and the like. So that's an interesting concept because um, a lot of the time people that are human people and that think that the entire universe, every universe and everything outside of it all seems to revolve around them. When in reality, the further up you go, less things really give a shit about yeah. this place. <laughs> like we've said oh, we've many a time, question. just one rock in billions of rocks. Do you feel that energy from all the attention spirits seem to be getting from especially science side have brought the spirits out more? Why are scientists so interested in spiritual afterlife? Okay. Okay. The main reason for that is because scientists are obsessed with the idea of living for longer. Medicine. It's a fear of death, essentially, isn't it? Yeah. So death's considered quite bad. Things that take death away, murder, malnourishment, all of that sort of thing is considered quite bad. The ultimate punishment, as supposedly, is the death penalty. People in general consider death to be a scary, really, really bad thing um, in society, certainly nowadays. And it's regarded with a lot of fear particularly in the west still yeah. in other places in the world but the west has probably won the award for being the most scared of death i think yeah um in terms of uh attention to spirits uh, energy flows where attention goes so we're trying to, I'll say trying instead of actually, there's working with spirits and then there's trying to work with spirits. There are a lot of spirits and stuff that don't really care much about the people that work and feed them, put it that way. Um, quite a lot of the spirits that you hear about in the mytho mythology books and the like, assuming they exist, some of the big ones are perfectly aware of the little gaggle and coven of neo-pagans down at the local stone straw call of praying and offering to them, don't much care much about them. They might take the energy, they might pay them a little visit, but it is one of those things. Where attention goes, energy flows. So, yes, attracting attention might draw the attention of a spirit, feeding it offerings and that is likely to get his attention but just because you're getting something's attention doesn't necessarily mean that it's he's interested in you it's the one of the uh i suppose invocation and evocation some of the things that people struggle to get their head around sometimes is because we just use these words for them whereas different practices and different ways about going about it some would say in terms of invocation and evocation where you invite something to come if it wants to come it will come other things such as you certainly find in some stereotypical ceremonial magic you force the thing to come and you threaten it yeah. you know i'm thinking kia solomon type magic so it really yeah. depends um very often if it's a strong enough spirit the mere act of thinking and intending and wanting it to come is enough to to get its attention whether it will come is another thing because it might not decide not to uh weaker things is a little bit more complicated um and certainly things that are further away that will struggle to manifest here is a lot more complicated but that goes into the secrets and the art of invocation and evocation the summing yeah. of the spirit is a, there's a lot more to it than just calling it unfortunately yeah there is a kind mm -hmm. of science behind that yeah like anything, you've got to provide the right environment. Mm. I don't feel death isn't the worst thing that can happen. Obviously, death's not the worst thing that can happen. But for the everyday individuals, a lot of people are scared of death and innate things. Uh, Self-preservation is a thing. Obviously, not everyone's scared of death. And there comes to a point where people that are scared of death are more scared of living, hence suicide or are willing to sacrifice yeah. themselves to save others and the like, which is technically a fear of death because you are scared of 
not you dying, your children dying, for example. So, you know, you might stop someone from shooting your kid by jumping in front of the bullet, but that is still kind of, to a certain extent, a fear of death because you're scared of your, your kid yeah. dying. Um, but yeah, of course, there's far worse things than death. The more you dabble with a magic and the more you progress with magic and the more you learn and the more you master the quote-unquote mysteries, the more you realize there's far worse things out there than death. <laughs> but much better ways of keeping you. Mm. I've had attachment once before. Not a good thing. Don't want to film that again. Okay. I think there's a story there. Sounds like there's a story there. Sounds like a story, definitely. Yeah, definitely sounds like a story there. I don't think it's a story that can be uh, told in the comments, but, you know, maybe yeah. we'll have to have a couple yeah. of people on at some point as a guest to tell their stories. And that. <laughs> yeah, tell that their stories. Fun. That could be fun. Like a live blog. Yeah, almost. You I mean, it's the Feisty Witches. We haven't got to be too serious with Feisty Witches. Yeah. Is I think it's important when you delve into deeper mysteries and complicated things to not be too serious about it. Because Keep when you get too people. serious about things, I find a lot of people don't absorb the information as much or get a little bit scared yeah. and apprehensive. Um, but, you know, Michelle says it's too long. Their story's too long. I presumed it would be too long. We didn't expect you to share it in the comments. Don't worry about that. But, yeah. But if you want to share it with us, by all means, you know, send us a, send us a message at some point or pop over to Witchcraft Live um, and pop it in there, in the feed in there, and you'll get a load of witches to talk about it. Um, it's probably the, the most fun things that go over uh, go on over in Witchcraft Live. Obviously, this is Q&A, so My Facebook we will keep group. talking about um, keep talking about Blavatsky in between people's questions. So, Or if there's particular things you want to know about Blavatsky, we'll try our best to answer them. I just think about whatever is your mission here, you'll do it and just live while you must live for create something good. However, is the long life or not, lol. But I believe in life after life. I like how you put life after <laughs> like life that. instead of life, life after, after death. Life, that's nice. Most people put life after death. Life after life. There are many a different a ways of a living, and I'm not just talking physically. Yeah, yeah. there are ways to actually explore every part of this existence while you're here. So I don't know how anyone could really get bored. Okay. Uh, and I don't mean just from a witchcraft point of view. I mean, you know, uh, philosophy, history, art, all those um, beautiful parts. Bless you, Liam. I had to mute it because I thought that I was going to sneeze everywhere. So, so what um, concepts are we uh, exploring today, Mr. Chris? Because a Blavatsky, people can uh, Google or on a Wikipedia, or, and she did. Uh, yeah. she did give us a lot of information in regards to occultism and that. Um, not my cup of tea because I don't like the writing style of that kind of era. I think you could condense quite easily Blavatsky. Yeah. When I've read Blavatsky, I did attempt to write, read Isis Unveiled and The Secret Doctrine from start to finish. I got quite far, in fact. wonder if there's... Still a, a bookmark in there. Just seeing if there's... Oh, yeah, there is a bookmark. There we go. Can you see that? Quite far. <laughs> Considering that's the front, that's quite far. That is the first volume. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I said, I've read I've read a lot of the Secret Doctrine. I haven't read much of uh, Isis uh, Unveiled. One because I thought it might offend me from what little mm. she does know. Um, because it was you that kind of mix. Which though, aren't you? You've got. Well, I you know can, you can't be looking too far down. Also, I I don't like, um, you know, when people use certain deities' names in uh, in their writings, and I wonder how 
if they've been given permission, shall we say. Right. So um what we've got a few more comments here. Um oh. there's a mention about grounding. We could probably give a better answer about that. I need good grounding. Ooh, depends on what we're classing as grounding. I think grounding, there's a lot of things to grounding. There's grounding as in keeping yourself sane. Mm -hmm. There's grounding as in remembering to come back here. Yeah. And then there's a grounding as in, to a certain extent, defensive mechanisms that can absorb energy instead of you retaining it. So we're talking kind of, to a certain extent, types of the cleansing then. Much like grounding in electrical systems, the little earth you've got on your plugs and that, that takes the dangerous things, dangerous electricity, when it's not doing what it's supposed to do. Yeah, when it's grounding. out of control. It's all so part of grounding. Yeah. yeah. So, but also, uh, some people like, um, you know, there's a lot of use of the word grounding within... Um, you know psychic arts and obviously in that situation they're talking about you know like all of the above i guess but at the same time um talking about you know keeping one foot on um the ground obviously um, yeah it's important to remember that you're human and you're alive so when you have magical practices that impact negatively on your physical body and your physical life that's not very stable and that can cause a lot of problems and you'll see a lot of people that try to do grounding i've met a lot of clients that do this and meditation and do the new agey kind of stuff where they do all the meditation and oh i'm so wonderfully grounded but it doesn't they're not grounded they're unbalanced because they're so I don't know what the technical term would be. Um, sedentary. Well, so yeah. <laughs> but their body's so incapable of uh, yeah. retaining the energy that it really needs yeah. to retain in order to do certain more complicated work. Whenever you have someone that makes all of their practice about grounding, it's kind of like someone with OCD trying to be a chef. They're spending too much time trying to clean up and they're too scared to make a mess that they don't actually do any cooking. Yeah. It's like a show kitchen. So you've got to be a little bit careful because being too grounded is ungrounding. Yeah. You focus too much on the mind and you forget about the body. Mm. Or vice versa. So, but um, yeah, it, I think... It might be one we need to add to the list, actually. Maybe we do an entire Fausty on different kinds really, of grounding and protection. I mean, it is a fundamental practice and one that gets discussed only by... What you hear about grounding is, yes, you need to ground. How do I do that? Oh, well, I do a meditation because that's grounding, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, the meditation is really, really grounding. That's great. Or sometimes I like to slap myself awake because that's grounding. Okay. But you're not actually exploring the uh, energetic bodies. Yep. And having an incorrectly grounded system means that things can travel from places to you and a cause of trouble. Think lightning. Lightning on a building. Bang. Destruction. The roof gets us smashed up. You know, burnt, scorched. Whereas if you've got the sufficient earth in a grounding, it, uh, that little church spire, the lightning attaches to the little metal rod sticking up and then travels down the little, well, it's not really little, it's quite a big fat wire that goes down the edge and then takes the energy away. So grounding is a very important part of defensive magic. It's also an extremely important part, much like an anchor. Grounding's an anchor, still part of the same thing. Um, so that you don't end up going off somewhere and not being able to get back. Um, it's all yeah. part of the grounding kind of... Um, Umbrella. Department, operation, part of magic. I don't know. don't know what we'd call it. Um, 
Oh, there we go. We've got quite a few comments coming in now. Had something's happened that wanted or has blocked my question mark? Can't find the right words, but I go woods. Okay. I think that might be two parts to the same sentence. I just discovered something lately about timelines and to me it's easy to connect. I think I developed something but not sure if any practitioner experienced it and already did it. Don't have a lot of info alike. I'd like to know someone in this timeline who is familiar with this kind of magic. Okay, so with regards to magic and areas of magic, pretty much everyone that puts information out in the form of a books and a blogs and the like. Generally, it's beginner level stuff and you get over it very quickly. You learn pretty quickly that there's no point in putting out information on an advanced level because no one's going to be able to read it. The people that can read it aren't all that interested because they're doing it anyway. So it's a really difficult one when it comes to I know what you're talking about you feel you've discovered something you feel you're the only one to do it you also feel that it's quite exciting but you haven't got anyone to talk about part of that will be down to the circles of company you keep the sort of practitioners that you're talking about if you're talking about the majority unfortunately of magical practitioners out there they don't do a lot of experimental magic they do a lot of copy and paste I'll do what the book says I'll do what the ritual that I was given is and I'll tweak it a little bit but in terms of really pushing yourself out there if you've uh, started to delving in and messing about with time good on you because a lot of people don't do that and you'll discover a lot of things that you won't be able to explain to other people. Not because it's naughty to explain concepts and mysteries to other people, although many would say it is, but mainly because if you did, no one would fucking understand anyway. So I do get, Stella, that you're in an awkward uh, awkward predicament here because you want to have a conversation about something, but at the same time, who are you going to talk to it about? They just look you blank like... Right. Yeah. We get it all the time. Um, but that's why we try to, you know, ultimately, particularly online, the online communities aren't that great. Um, we try to group magical practitioners together that actually do magic. That's what we had the Witchcraft Live Facebook group and the No Holds Barred Witchcraft Facebook group for the kind of more advanced people. Um, for people to talk about practices and that. But very often, the way magic tends to work is you get drawn to people that are on your kind of level and wavelengths and practice similarly to how you practice. And unfortunately, that can become a bit of an echo chamber and everyone's doing similar or the same things. Is only when you mix with other people that are on really different bizarre paths and that you bring something up because we can yeah. talk about magical practitioners we've met, Chris, that they're quite high level practicing magicians and witches and the like. They do all sorts of wonderful things, but they don't know what to talk about. They're not just going to come out with something. If you were to say, yeah. oh, I went off and did this, I was uh, reaching yeah. through and I was uh, taking a people from a one place and I was putting in parts and fragments of their soul in a place they should not be in. A lot of people might think, Oh, that's crazy ass stuff. I don't know what you're talking about there. But you might get the one or two of us like, oh, I do that. But you'd never know that if you hadn't have suggested and kind of talked about something. And now I'm going yeah. off on a different tangent. So no, what are we fine, talking about, Chris? It's, it's, it's following the same line. Uh, it's that kind of constant, um, you know, is it is it safe to talk about it in, in this situation? Um, or are people going to be able to follow what I'm saying? Um mm. And obviously, with what Stella's talking about, um, some of these things are easier for, for some than others. Some people are naturally gravitate towards certain types of magic or certain types of witchcraft. Um, and I don't mean kind of like, you know, um, Insta witches and they're, you know, what I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I love rose quartz, those kind of people. What I'm talking about is, you know, someone, some people like, because obviously we often use scratch testing 
when you're first you're meeting new witches for mentor programs to see where they're naturally good at things you know some people have got really great connections to their previous selves um, some people are, um, are really good at looking back but aren't very good at looking forward uh, you've got some people that have got, always got the power to do whatever the hell they like but aren't able to actually force something under its will so you know you kind of you get all these kinds of different people that all all have um different kind of presets should we say or muscles in the right place you know the same as people in in physicality some people are built better to run fast um some people are built better to hide you know or whatever um and with this particular type of um, magic they're referring to, uh, access to previous time can be a tricky one for people that don't understand that process um, to be able to actually have those kind of conversation. Um, you know, it's, re it's, it's hard for those that, you know, step in and out of all their lives uh, and are able to, you know, naturally download that information or upload that information. Um, obviously, others aren't so good at that. We did a podcast recently, didn't we, on past life pokeballs? Um, this um, kind yeah. of a concept of jumping in and out of uh, you know periods in time along your own timeline. Um, you know, but then you get people that are naturally good at that, and then you get other people that aren't good with past lives. Uh, but can see ev see the outcome to everything. Are so really good at looking forward at like where we are from this point of view, looking outwards at all the forks in the road at that side. So you know, the, the beginners tend to stumble because they you need to both delve in and tinker, but you also need to reflect. And you get the beginners that delve in and mess about with too many things that go from one thing to the next to the next to the next. Never take a moment and think, okay, what have I learned here? How is that applicable? Yeah. And actually mull it over and think about it. Then you get the other people that all they do is think about it and theorize and read books and try to build Never up with them actually having tinkered. And the thing is what you need to do is you need to take, if you're wanting to explore quote unquote, the big questions, the big concepts, such as like all the stereotypical ones, reincarnation, is that a thing? What happens when you die, all that sort of thing. You need to think, okay, I'm gonna start tinkering with that. So I'm gonna start doing is I'm gonna say, okay, someone's gonna die. I'm gonna go and stop that from happening. Or I'm gonna go and uh, make that quicker. Or I'm gonna go and try and fuck about with the process. When you fuck about the pro with the process of something like that, something big, is no different than people that take things apart and try and put them back together again. You might not get it right entirely, but you'll learn a hell of a lot about the thing by tinkering with During it. the process. You might have taken your computer apart and won't know which chips go in what order and that. But eventually, having done it enough times, you'll learn more and more and more and more. And then when you get a specific thing, there's this one little chip. You can ask an expert or do further research on that very specific component, that very specific part. And you'll learn a hell of a lot more from that. Um, but obviously, you then need to reflect on what you've been tinkering with. Because otherwise, it's insanity to do the same thing over and over again. If you're doing that same thing again, you need to push past that. And you say, I've learned all I can from that now. I need to tinker with another aspect of this, yeah. another part of the yeah. subject, and see how all these things all link in together. Um, I feel just like I'm starting, but yes, that's true. Anyone can have a different development about some areas or a way to describe it. Yeah. If I want to approach you about mentoring, what would you need from me first and where do I actually do it? Do I send you PMs on Facebook or on Patreon? So the Thoth Witchcraft Patreon is our platform for mentoring people. Um, yeah. What so I'll Michelle's do, already I'll... on there, so it's entirely up to her really. Yeah. Do you want, if you want to speak to us, 
uh, if you want to speak to us via Patreon first and then arrange whatever. But I think you, I think I've got some messages from you in Facebook. So if you want to message us that way, um, I can join you up that way. But essentially, it's whatever suits you. Um, we just need to arrange a chat with the two of us and yourself um, and see where you want to get to. And we can start we can start mentoring to, to how to get you to your goals. So. If you've got particular interests that you want to follow through, that would be a good way to start. Um, obviously, uh, we'll get to know you um, and can kind of push you in what what ways we think will allow you to achieve your goal better. So it's um, it's mentoring as opposed to teaching. So therefore, it's helpful if you know what you want to achieve um, or at least the direction in which you want to achieve it even if you can just start going further down the garden path in that particular direction and um, you might then discover goals that you want to achieve and then we'll just keep following you following up with you and following you through the process as best you can um but yeah like liam's just put on the screen um if you haven't gone and joined our patreon patreon uh, one first and foremost if you listen to our podcast um it's the extended versions and other content are all on there michelle would tell you all about that um and then if you actually the other thing we offer is a free mentoring service that goes alongside it um that you know we'll um meet you as often as you need to really um in order to achieve what you want to achieve so it's uh, very cheap is all i'm going to say yeah, so it's the No Holds Barred Witchcraft podcast is the name of the podcast. We normally go into slightly more in-depth types of magic. The Thoth Witchcraft Patreon gives you some extras that we can't really release publicly because it may be a bit naughty. When you're on the Patreon, there's a little messaging service. So you can just type us a message. And then what we do is we get back to you and find how would you like to go about doing your mentoring? Would you like us to do video course? through WhatsApp or Messenger, or are you geographically close by so we can meet you in a coffee shop or something? Yeah. Or I've got one at the moment at the graveyard I see once a week. Um, yeah. You know, and it's a case it works an awful lot like a personal trainer. So you decide what your goal is. It's ideally got to be a big goal. And then what we do is we then break that big goal into smaller goals. And then we set you little tasks obviously we know through you completing those tasks will get you closer and closer to that ultimate goal accomplishing that ultimate goal so we break things down ideally the big goals can be absolutely anything and the most important thing is to always think anything is possible so if you think it's an impossible goal that is the sort of thing you should be saying that's my goal because normally the people with the impossible goals are the ones that get to a higher level quicker because they're thirsty yeah. for stuff. When people have a lower goals, simple goals, then you get there fairly quickly um, and you don't really, you're not really pushing yourself. So we get lots of people where they get to their goals that they think are big and they end up saying well that actually was quite easy it was a lot easier than i yeah. thought and then they pick some massive big goal because they finally worked out oh actually what i really want to do is this so in terms yeah. of what people's goals are it's crazy we've got people on all sorts of different paths that want all sorts of different things but we never tell you what it should be it's always got to come from you no. But yeah, we like pushing pushing you as far as we possibly can to get the the best experience out of you that we possibly can. So like Liam yeah, said, we, it's very much personal trainer behaviour. Yeah, we, we try to do the mentoring because we don't have curriculums. We don't believe in curriculum-based learning because these people that will try and sell you magical systems that are supposed to work for everyone or ones that you tweak, when you come up against something after having learned a magical system, you come up against something new. You don't necessarily have the skills to be able to know how to deal with it. However, when we say to you, we're not going to teach you a magical system. We're going to teach you techniques that you can use to explore things, 
go off and explore that thing, come back, we have a talk about it, we reanalyze things, and then, you know, that constant movement is always you in the driving seat of deciding where you're going to go and how far down that rabbit hole you want to go down. Whereas when you have curriculum-based stuff, it's a case of we feel you need to learn a bit of divination, and then it generally doesn't go far enough. Or you might find it absolutely boring and you want to go and learn some badass spell casting, in which case, well, if that was the year two of your training, then with these curriculum based things or module six or something, then it's kind of like, well, I want to learn that now. So that's what we do. We go in the direction that you want and then we go as far down that direction as you want to go. So we're just here to guide you at the end of the day, not tell you what you should be doing. Again, with regards to ethics as well, we don't really guide people in terms of telling people what their ethics should be. Um, but we will explore that with you because whenever you're doing magic, whenever you're actually doing something, you will come up against ethical dilemmas and you will have to think, how does this make me feel? Do I want to do this? Because you're tinkering with things that are big you know walking down the street to the local shop there's not a lot of things that you've got to really think about there you know you might encounter some thief that's trying to steal the purse of an old lady and you might decide do i gonna intervene here or am i not gonna intervene here but it's not really you know not big level stuff but when you're talking about oh i've never ever even contemplated that this would be possible and now you're trying to think of the ramifications of going ahead and doing something you know it's interesting you explore the magic the magical world and you explore yourself at the end of the day because doing weird things and accomplishing great tasks and going down that rabbit hole you can't help but learn more about yourself so you know but yeah anyway get back to us whenever you want um what else are we talking about then chris because we're close well, to the end now we're close to the end already but i don't know where that's gone um but you know if you've got any last minute questions throw them on um and we'll you know we always stay longer than we mm -hmm. you know um if you you know if you've got interesting questions we'll keep going um so but yeah, it's one of those things. It's personal to everybody. Um, you know, neither of us is going to suggest you necessarily go read Bl Blavatsky um, in order to make those kind of decisions. We're more likely to tell you to go and watch Thoth TV or or on the Witchcraft Live group, go and see some videos and kind of go, OK, I've got some ideas now of what I want to do and then bounce back. What's nice about the Witchcraft Live group, though, is that... Um, Obviously, people share their experience on there that are fairly new to witchcraft. Um, and there's a mixture of kind of more advanced people on there. So it just gives you a chance to kind of bounce ideas around. Um, uh, you know, and we can we can get on. We can get on from that. So, um, you know, don't worry. Um, everyone has to start somewhere. And, and like we were saying with Stella earlier, you know, there will be parts of it that you are naturally good at. Um, the goal event really should be in the first is being a lot more balanced. Um, you know, yes, it's important to have things that we're particularly good at. But um, if you're going to follow a path in witchcraft, then obviously you need to be fairly balanced because not everyone is going to share the same opinions and feelings of you. Um, and if you come up against problems, you want to be able to overcome them. Um, so what will be the trouble when you learn from a um a system based system uh would be that obviously often that is weighted in one particular way or another um so it's just you know systems do work but we personally prefer you to find your system yourself but yeah there we go so this is the Fasty Witches show. Obviously, we're here every Wednesday at 8 o'clock or around about 8 o'clock. Uh, the yes. Fasty Witches show is brought to you by the Keep On Chatting Network. If you want to see past shows of ours on different subjects, then you can go on the Keep On Chatting YouTube channel or on the Facebook page. If you want to see other shows that aren't as good as ours, we're almost <laughs> as good as ours. You can also find yeah. those shows there as well. So that's it for this week. 
and goodbye, everyone. Bye. Bye.